The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. So let me tell you this amazing story. Oh, I'm so happy you came this week. This week I have for you a grand slam. Something unbelievable. Davot Agdoshim, the city of Hebron. I remember many years ago I was lucky enough. I was in Eretz Israel as a Bachur for about almost four years before I came back. And then Bar Hashem, I met my wife. And we got married here and then I went back to Eretz Israel for another three and a half years in Kolel. And then finally I came back here again. It's amazing to me. When I was a Bachur in that time, one Shabbat, a friend of mine told me, Hey, Dovi, let's go to Hebron, the Shabbat. This week is Parashat Chayesara. Ooh, I heard about this week. Wow, they go crazy over there. Yeah, wow, this is amazing. Let's do it. They had buses coming from all over Israel. We jumped on one of those buses. We went out to Hebron. Ladies, I want to tell you something. I walked into shul. The festivities started in the middle of the tefillah. L'chad doni. They started dancing in the shul. It looked like a wedding. They were dancing. L'chad doni. They danced outside. It looked like some hot Torah. They danced right outside the shul. And then the other shuls came outside into the street. And they were dancing. And everyone was dancing. I'm looking around like, what in the world went on with this town? It's, it's amazing because when you grow up in America, this Shabbat is just another weekend. All of a sudden, <laughs> you come to Hebron and the place is popping. That night, every house, there were parties. You literally look like the Purim Suda. You go from house to house to house. And every house, you come, oh, come on in. They pull you in. Ma Shem Oh, me America. Yesh let orech me America. They hand you a beer and they tell you, is it as good as the American beers? And they no. And we go every time and we start singing and dancing and kumzit. What a Shabbat. And this was 20 years ago when I was still single. Could you imagine today? I heard it's much more today. Ay, let me tell you something about this magical city, the city of our fathers, the city of our roots, the city of our roots. In the 1500s, at that time, the Sultan of Turkey, the Turkish Empire, was ruling a large part of the world. They were the superpower at that time. And Israel was under the Turkish rule. Now, the Sultan of Turkey, the king, so to speak, his nephew, they called him the Pasha. His nephew was the ruler at that time, or the governor, of Israel. So the Pasha, the nephew of the king of Turkey, he was in charge in rule of the entire land of Israel in those years. And he would come every now and then to the city of Hebron, because obviously as an Arab and very devout to Islam, he would come to Ma'arat HaMachpelah, because he felt claim to Abraham Avinu through Yishmael. So sure enough, no different today like then, he would come into Ma'arat HaMachpelah. And ladies, I don't know if you've seen this. I was lucky enough, the first time I ever went to Israel, was the best bar mitzvah present that I've ever gotten in my life. It was given to me by my parents. My parents sent me at the age of 13 for my bar mitzvah present to Israel. That was the deal. The deal was that we have this big bar mitzvah. My father gets to keep all the presents. And I get a ticket to Israel. That was a deal. I really believed I got the better deal, I mean, honestly. He, that summer, normally I went to sleepaway camp, but that summer, I was going to Israel. I went alone. It was at different times, you know. I went alone. I was staying there by my grandmother, Alea Shalom, my grandpa, grandfather, Alea Shalom, who lived at that time in Ramat Eshkol, right in the center of Jerusalem. And I went around touring, and I met up with friends. This was before the Intifada took place. That's right, I'm that old. This was before the Intifada took place. I was 13 years old at the time. That was the first time I ever went to Marat HaMachpelam. The first time I went anywhere in my life. It's my first time in Israel. Well, I remember that first time, and I'm telling you this in order to give you clarity on the story you're about to hear. When you walked in that big room where all the Arabs had their carpets out and they're sitting all over the place and praying all day over there, where they kind of turned it into a makeshift uh, mosque type of a thing, in the middle of the floor was a big hole. I don't know if you remember this. It's a big hole. Now, even at that time, when I was 13, I walked up, I was stepping over Arabs. I'm not joking, really. No, but at that time, it wasn't scary. It wasn't even, they, the Intifada didn't start yet. They actually moved aside to let you through. Yeah, there was before, you know. So I stepped on from carpet to carpet. I felt like Aladdin. I was going from, <laughs> I, was going, I was going from carpet to carpet to carpet. And then I made it to the middle of the center of the room. And there was the big hole. And the hole had these bars. Now you couldn't go through it. It was, it was barred off. But you were able to look down the hole. And you saw kind of a black hole there. But you saw a little bit of some sort of a silhouette of this cement looking type of a staircase that went its way down, all the way underneath to the tunnel, underneath Ma'arat HaMachpelah, 
where the Avot HaKdoshim are actually buried. And you were able to see it. Today, you can't even get into that room. Today, it's way too dangerous to go into that room. Nobody goes into that room because of the obvious reasons. Yeah. But nonetheless, in the 1500s, that hole in the floor was not barred off. It was opened. But everybody knew from history, many stories, that anyone that ever went down never came back up. So the Arabs knew it's, it's off limits. They guarded the hole, so to speak. And the most hashuv spot in the entire floor was the spot right next to the hole. Whenever the Pasha would come to Hebron to pray on Fridays, of course, he would come in, everyone would announce his presence, they would all stand up for his honor, they would spread the way, he would come in, roll out his carpet right next to the hole, then he would get down on his hands and knees, and he would pray into the hole, because he's praying directly to Ibrahim, direct. I said that pretty good, right? Right straight down, I was been in the community, right straight down in, in the hole. Turns out that this Pasha, he had a knife that was given to him as a present from the king of Turkey. It was given to him, and this was a knife. It was a royal heirloom. This knife demonstrated your status in royalty. Anyone who carried this knife showed that they were part of the royal Turkish family. It wasn't just a regular knife. It had, gold. It had little diamonds and precious stones on it. It was made out of gold. It was, it was something beautiful. And by far, you can imagine, that this was the Pasha's most valuable, precious possession. He had this knife on the inside pocket of his jalabiyah that he used to wear. But this time, when he bent down onto all fours, praying inside the hole, you know what happened. The knife slipped right out of his pocket as he was bending over and went right down the hole. Tink, tink, ta tink, tink, ta tink, 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 right down the steps, all the way into the tunnel underneath Marat HaMachpelah. Holy! The Pasha was in an uproar. He started screaming, my knife! That was the knife that was given to me by the king of Turkey. My uncle, I need, that, that's my, my, my claim to, to royalty. My, my prized possession, I need it back. Well, what do you think he does? He announces to all the Arabs in the room, the man that goes down, I'm going to award him. And he starts telling him all types of money and all types of gold. And you know the Arabs, he promises him in the next world, instead of getting 70, he's going to get 140. I, I'm not going to say I'm in a shul, I can't talk, uh, like, you, know, but, uh, you, you, know, you know the rhetoric, you know, it, it starts promising him all types of things that only an Arab would want. And of course there's a volunteer. So they bring this thick rope, and very similar to, they took this from us of course, back in the days of the second Bayit, Bayit Shani, because the Kohen Gadol not always was the most righteous, because the Kehuna in those days was bought by money. So they would put a rope around the Kohen Gadol's waist, and when he would go in on Yom Kippur, to Kodesh Kodashim, if he wasn't worthy enough, and he would die, they would pull him out. Like this, they'd be able to get the body back. They'd be able to actually bury him. But they had a system, it was a pulley system, where every now and then they would give a tug onto the rope, and then the Kohen would tug back. Now, if you don't get the tug back, that means he's no longer tuggable, and you're going to have to pull him out of the water at that point, because he's He's kaput. He's gone. So they decided to do this system with this Arab. They wrapped this thick rope around his waist, and they lowered him down onto the steps, and they lowered him down under Marat the Machpela to go and retrieve the knife. As the Arab is going down, they pull, he pulls back. They pull, he pulls back. After two minutes, they pull, no pull back. They pull again, they start screaming down the hole, Ahmad! They pull, Nothing. Shlonak! Chifak! Pull! Nothing. I don't know. This point, they pull him up. They pull him up with a bunch of men. He's very heavy now. They pull him up and pull him up. And there he is, hanging at the end of the rope, dead. No knife, dead. They all got very nervous. Oh, now the Pasha has to pull out big money for the next volunteer. It's different when you see the first guy dead. Now he has to promise not 140 in the next world, a kingdom of in the next world. And he has to double the money and triple the money and give the guy titles and da 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 da. And he, sure enough, he finds another guy, Mejnun, that comes along and he's ready to go. He takes him, wraps him on the rope, they send him down, they pug, he tugs. Two minutes later, they pull him up. He's hanging at the end like a worm on a hook. He's dead. Unbelievable. 
they realize that this isn't working. And the Pasha, he's not ready to give up that knife. So he decided, you know what he's going to do? A Rasha Merusha. Look at the Rashaim. Look what they are. Look what they are. He said, just like this place is holy to us, it's holy to the Jews as well. Why is this my problem? Let it be their problem. What did he do? He walked right out of Manat the Machpelah. He took his army and he came that night into the shul in Hebron. And he announced to the rabbi in the entire shul of Hebron, it's your fault that when I bent down and prayed, my royal knife fell down into the hole and went down on the Marat HaMachpelah. If the Jewish people don't return me my royal knife in exactly one week, one week from tonight, it's Friday night, it's Friday night, Shabbat. One week from tonight, I'm coming back with my army and next Shabbat, I'm going to wipe out the entire Jewish community of the city of Hebron, men, women, and children. You have one week to retrieve my, my knife. Oh, vey. That Shabbat, no one slept. What a gezerah min ha-shamayim. What a decree on the Jewish people of Hebron. For the next three days, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, they had Yom Tefillah. They prayed and prayed and prayed. Wednesday and Thursday, Yom Tanit. Again, they prayed. They prayed. And then finally, after an entire week of praying and fasting and praying and fasting, they made a goral. They went and they drew lots. And they took the name of every single man in the city of Hebron. And they put it in this large pot. And they mixed the names around. And they wanted to find out from Shamayim which man, which Jewish man was destined to go down underneath Ma'arat the Machpelah. Because if not, you have Lo Aleinu, you have Gzerat Shmad. Go wipe out the whole city. You're going to save the whole Jewish city. Somebody has to go down. They draw the lot. And lo and behold, the name that comes out, Rabbi Avraham Azulai, the rabbi of the city of Hebron. It always falls on the rabbi for some reason. The great Rabbi Avraham Azulai, the grandfather of the Chida. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The Chida used to talk about his grandfather, Abraham Azulai. He said he was a Malach Hashem. He was a Gadol Hador. He wrote so many Svarim, his famous Svarim, the Chesed La Avraham. Svarim on Kabbalah. He, he, was, he, was, he was beyond what words can capture. He was a giant of a giant of a Gadol. Torah Nigla, Torah Nistar. He was unbelievable. And here he was. And all the eyes turned to the rabbi, Rabbi Abraham Azulai, and they said, Rabbi Avraham, Shamayim wants you to go down. Rabbi Avraham said, I accept Shamayim's decision. I'm going to go home now and say goodbye to my wife and children. I don't know what Shamayim is going to decide for me. He went home. He said goodbye to his family. He said goodbye to his congregation, to his people. And they all escorted the rabbi that Thursday night. And when the word got out that the famous Rabbi Avraham Azulai, the great Sadiq, is going down underneath Ma'arat HaMachpelah. The word spread like fire. The Pasha came with his whole army. They just wanted to watch this. They wanted to see what was going to take place. All the Arabs came from far and wide, from Jerusalem, from all over, from Gilo. They wanted to just see this moment. Ma'arat HaMachpelah that night was swarmed with thousands of people. And when the rabbi entered with his congregation, they opened up the crowd. And they allowed him to enter. The rabbi walks into the big room. Rabbi Abraham Azulai comes up to the big hole in the floor. And they wrapped the rope around his waist as well. And they told him, Rabbi, the Arab tells him, when I tug, you tug back. He says, Ya Hamor, you took that from us. You're telling me the rules. You took that from the Kohen Gadol Bet Amikdash. You're telling me the rules. You chutzpah, you, 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 you chutzpah. They lower the rabbi down onto the stairwell, and down to the tunnel underneath Marat HaMachpelah. And the rabbi disappears into the, into the darkness. And every now and then they pull, and he pulls back. And they pull, and he pulls back. Oh, the rabbi's alive. He's down there five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. Finally, the rabbi gives a big pull. And that was a signal. Pull up! Just then, they pull up. But the rope, instead of getting very heavy, it got very light. And they're pulling up the rope and pulling up the rope and pulling up the rope. And suddenly the end of the rope comes out. And there was no rabbi. There was just the knife of the Pasha wrapped and tied in the rope. The Pasha, he couldn't believe his eyes. He started jumping up and down. He was screaming, Allah, come on. He was going crazy. He grabbed the knife. He said, oh, I have to thank the rabbi. That moment, the whole Jewish community was saved.
This was a Yeshua. It was unbelievable Yeshua. Where's the rabbi? Everyone's like, what happened to the rabbi? He pulled. He gave us the signal. That means he's alive. But isn't he coming back? An hour passed. And nobody moved. They just sat silent, waiting. Just to see what's going to be. After an hour, they hear the voice of the rabbi at the bottom of the hole. And he screams to them, Throw me the rope. They throw down the rope. He puts it around his waist. They hoist him up onto the steps. And they pull him up on the top and pull him right out of the hole. They saw on the face, Rabbi Abraham Azulai's face. This was at night. Rabbi Abraham Azulai's face was glowing like the sun. The Arabs said that they couldn't look at him. The Arabs all dropped on their hands on their carpets. Nobody spoke. Rabbi Abraham Azulai just simply walked out. Everyone followed him. Everyone from the shul, all the Jews, walked right back out with the rabbi. And he went straight to his house. And he sits down on his table. And all the Jews of Hebron make their way into the rabbi's house and the surrounding areas. And they said, Rabbi, no, tell us. What did you see? What happened down there? How did you live? How did you survive? How did you make it out alive? Rabbi Rav Zulai, his face was different. He looks around the room and he says, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. When they lowered me down to the bottom, I started to walk down this long, dark corridor, like a long tunnel. And I started to see, off to the right, there were these little kubiot, these little small rooms built into the cave. And each step I took, there was another little room, and another little room, and a room after that. And I realized that each one of the Avot HaKadoshim and the Imahot were in a separate room. But I wouldn't dare walk into the room. I stood outside in the hall. And just then, I saw a figure of a man walking towards me. This man was much bigger than I was. I started to shake out of fear. I didn't know what this was coming at me. I never saw a man that tall. He says, this man walks right up to me. And all when he came close, I was able to make out his beard and his mouth. And he said to me in Hebrew, Ma'ashem Shalcha. And I said to him, To me, Abraham Azulai Mechevron. And he said to me, Ata, Rabbi Abraham Azulai, Rav Shel Chevron? And I said, Yes. Oh, he said to me, We were waiting for you. We were waiting for you to come there. Rabbi Abraham says, I started to tell this person all the terrible things that went on in the last week. And the Pasha, the Gzena from Shamaim. And he said to me, we know. The Avot Doshim were praying all week with you that the decree of Shamaim should be batel to save the Jews of Hebron and their lives. We were praying all week with you. We know exactly what's going on. Finally, says Abraham Azulai, I turned back to him and I said to him, Mi ata? Ma Hashem shelcha? And he says back to me, Hashem sheli Eliezer Eved Avraham Avinu. He says, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was standing in front of Damesek Eliezer. I was standing in front of Eliezer, Eved, that's the 1500s, Eved Avraham Avinu. I said to him, Ta be'emet Eliezer, he said, Ken, ani Eved ne'eman, he says, I never left the side of my master. All these years, I'm here in Ma'arat HaMachpelah, being mishamesh, my Adon, Abraham Avinu, and being mishamesh, all the avot in Imahot, I'm here to take care of them on all their needs. And that's all I do. I'm just taking care of them all day and all night. Avraham Azulai says, Eliezer, please, I want to meet your master. I want to meet your Adon. I want to meet Abraham Avinu. Eliezer says, Reb Avraham Azulai, I can't be the one to give you permission. Let me go into my Adon, my master. Let me ask him Rashut. Am I allowing you to come in or not? Eliezer goes into one of the cubicles that were off to the side of the Ma'ara. He walks into one stone room and he walks out two minutes later and he says, My master, Abraham Avinu, is wants to tell you Baruch Haba. He invites you in. He wants you to come in. He was waiting to see you. Please, come in. This was the real Tfadalu. You know, the... <laughs> so they brought him in. Rabbi Abraham Azulai enters this small room and he says in the corner of the room, there was Abraham Avinu. He says the shine, the light that was coming off of Abraham Avinu's face was so powerful that when he looked at him, he fainted. At that minute, Eliezer ran, grabbed alim, which are leaves from Gan Eden, 
came running back and put it under his nose to revive him. He woke back up. And this time Eliezer tells Rabbi Ram Azulai, don't look at him. You can't look at him and live. You know that. Don't look at him. Close your eyes. And he closed his eyes. He only got a tiny glimpse of Abraham Avinu, but he couldn't look. And Abraham Avinu said, Baruch haba, Rebbe Avraham Azulai. How is the, the, my children? How is the children of Hebron? How are the people of Hebron? We were davening all week that this Gezerah from Shamayim should be Batel. Has it been Batel yet? And he says, yes, I sent up the knife. It's already Batel. Oh, Abraham Avinu was so happy. Then finally, Rabbi Azulai says, Abraham Avinu, he says, I sent up the knife. I sent up the hevel. I sent back the rope. But not me. Not going back. I'm staying here with you. I already said goodbye to my family. I already said goodbye to my kihila. I'm staying here with you. Abraham Avinu says, Rabbi Abraham, we would love for you to stay with us. However, as a human being, in a goof, it's impossible. Not shaykh. I am ready to be megaleh to you the unbelievable secrets of Torah but not in a body, not with a goof. Go back up. Go back to your house. Tell the Jews of Hebron what you saw. Tell them the Avot Akdoshim are with Klal Yisrael. Every Jew. They know exactly what's going on and they pray for every one of us in our tzarot. It's unbelievable. You understand what it means to be rooted? You understand that, that those roots are alive. And he says then, when you say goodbye and tell everyone what you saw, then tomorrow morning, You'll give your body back to the Maker, and your neshama will come back to Ma'arat Machpelah, and you'll stay with me, and we'll learn the Ginze Torah, the secrets of Torah together. Rabbi Ramazai says, when I heard that, I agreed. I came back down the tunnel, and he says, as I was walking down the tunnel, all the Avot, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov came out from their kubiot, from their little rooms, and they were milavet. It's a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. The Rambam writes that the mitzvah of livui, of escorting your guests out, is greater than even the mitzvah of the seuda of the actual hachnasat orchim that you fed your guests. A bigger mitzvah than feeding them is escorting them to the door. All three of Abraham, can you imagine that? Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov walking Rabbi Abraham Azulai down the hall. And then they stop. They said, we can't go past this point. This point, you go. And then you'll come back to us tomorrow. Rabbi Ramzulai walks further. He's under the hole. That's when he screamed to throw down the rope. They threw him down the rope. And the rest of the story we know. Says Rabbi Abraham, he's now turning to his family, to the Kila. He says, I'm here to say goodbye for real. Tomorrow morning, I'm being taken from Shamayim. And my Nishama is going to go back to Marat HaMachpelah. But Klal Yisrael, you have to know. You have to know the Avot HaKdoshim. You have to know that they're praying for you. And they're with you. And they know what you're going through. And you're rooted in them, and that root is alive. Unbelievable. That night, Rabbi Abraham, all night long, he learned Torah. The next morning, he came out to Vatikim to pray. He said goodbye to his family. And after Shul, he said goodbye to his congregants and all the Jews of Hebron. And they were crying, Rabbi Abraham, don't leave us. We need you. Everybody needs the rabbi when he's about to die. You know that. <laughs> Up until that point, yeah. I'm joking. You know I'm joking. Please don't leave. He says, this is what we decided. He went back to his home. He lay down on his bed. And when his family surrounded him, he said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. V'yatsa nishmato be'echad. His neshama left him upon uttering the word Echad. And they buried his body. This was the Friday, two days ago. Friday, Parashat Chayesara. That's his yard site. Friday, Parashat Chayesara. He took his body and they buried him in the cemetery right next to Hebron, right next to Marat HaMachpelah in Hebron. And sure enough, legend has it that his neshama returned to Ma, like, like the deal, Marat HaMachpelah, to learn the amazing Sodot Torah from Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov. Ay, 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 look at the roots. Look what we have. Look what's behind us. Look what we're connected to. And it's so alive. And it's so real. And the next time you pray Amidah, Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzhak, you can hear their voices behind us. You could feel their presence. We have a backing. We have a gav. We have roots that are unbelievable. We could be tiny people, but we stand on the shoulder of giants. And you know what happens? Even when a tiny person stands on the shoulder of a giant, they're a giant too. That's what makes the Jewish people giants. Don't ever forget who you are. Thank you for listening. 
Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. StoriesToInspire.org.